Well, um, welcome everyone uh, on Zoom and um, nice to see folks here in person. Um, I'm Anthony Ong, and I'm um, really delighted to present our first speaker today, Frank Mann, who's going to kick us off uh, our fall um, speaker series that's being sponsored by the Center for Innovative Development Science. Um, Frank is a uh, research scientist um, in the Department of Family, Population, and Preventative Medicine at uh, Stony Brook Medicine. He received his um, PhD at the University of Texas, Austin, working with Paige Harden and Elliot Tucker, and then moved on to the University of Minnesota, where he did a postdoc uh, with Bob Kruger. Um, Frank is an interdisciplinary researcher. He has interests in topics such as stress, which you'll hear about today, psychopathology, cognition, well-being. Um, I know Frank through uh, the Midas Network, where I recently um, heard him present, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, here was uh, a guy who was really asking critical questions about stress measurement and also bringing sophisticated quantitative methods to bear uh, on those questions. And so I'm really delighted that he's accepted uh, the invitation to come share his insights with us today. So welcome, Frank. Thank you. All righty. So um, today I'm going to be talking about different uh, ways of thinking about and modeling uh, the accumulation of stressors and their impact on health um, outcomes over time. So I figure definitions are typically a good place to start. Um, so by stressors, I have in mind internal or external events that are subjectively unpleasant, disrupt homeostasis and result in a physiological or psychological response. Now, researchers have long sought to identify the key psychosocial stressors that pose a threat to public health and contribute to health disparities. And stressors that induce repeated activation of stress responses are generally thought to be the most potent as they can lead to permanent structural and functional changes that give rise to tissue damage and disease. But uh, despite this general agreement that cumulative stress or repeated stressors are uh, more deleterious than single exposures, as reviewed by Slavic, there is little agreement on what features of stressors are most important to measure. The optimal number of dimensions, the relative importance of different dimensions at different life stages, and how to model simultaneous and repeated exposures to stressors all remain uh, open-ended and unresolved questions. Now, I believe uh, part of the reason, at least, that many of these questions remain unresolved is that stress has been viewed quite differently um, over the years. So stress may be viewed as a uniform physiological response pattern, regardless of the type of stressor. Or it could be viewed as the amount of change and readjustment that a person experiences in life. So that is the more life changes, the more stress. Or it could be viewed primarily as a function of interpersonal factors like perceived controllability. Others have viewed stress as being caused by disruption to the pursuit of personal goals or by the exacerbation of existing vulnerabilities. And what some colleagues and I uh, recently recommended in a, a paper we published in uh, 2021 was that we might shift focus uh, to patterns of co-variation among many different stressors to empirically derived dimensions of stress that, most be, uh, that may be the most deleterious for health. And from this perspective, the stressors that are most highly correlated with other stressors may be the most deleterious as they indicate a high likelihood of simultaneous exposure to multiple stressors. Um, now, this is going to be a, a perspective and, and point to which I return. Uh, but for a moment, let's, let's talk about measuring cumulative stress. So... Uh, generally, in-person interviews are still considered uh, the gold standard when it comes to measuring cumulative stress. Um, they provide uh, the greatest breadth and, and depth of uh, coverage in the relative, uh, relevant content space. Um, I have in mind uh, interviews like the Life Events and Difficulty Schedule or the UCLA Life Stress Interview. Um, but of course, 
in-person interviews are costly, both in terms of money and, and time and resources. It requires extensive training of interviewers and raters. Um, so some folks have, have opted for alternative online interviews. I have in mind like this, the stress and adversity inventory abbreviated strain which really are just computer adapted versions of these in-person interviews that, you know, em employ branching logic, are, are less costly, more, more time efficient, um, uh, but while sacrificing uh, a bit of uh, quality in terms of the, the trustworthiness of, of responses. And then finally, the most common way to measure cumulative stress in empirical studies is the construction of composite scores from existing measures. Uh, very often, you'll see comp a composite index of continuously scored stressors. Uh, so what you see here is that folks z-score a whole bunch of stressors, they sum them, and then they z-score that sum score. Another approach is to calculate a cumulative risk exposure index, which you see done quite commonly. And with the cumulative risk exposure index, what people are doing is they're dichotomizing continuously scored stressors, uh, typically by taking the upper uh, quartile or quintile or decile. Um, and then they sum up all of those dichotomized stressors and do a simple composite score. And this of course has the advantage of uh, being able to combine continuously scored stressors with binary um, events that uh, folks might have records on. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we're talking about sort of simple, straightforward uh, sum scores, unit weighted sum scores um, to create these composite measures from the existing measures that uh, we have. And this is what I'm going to primarily be focusing on today is, is trying to improve uh, this approach. So there are, of course, assumptions among researchers. Uh, or assumptions that are made by researchers who are using these traditional composite scores. Um, and they typically have in mind the following advantages. One, that they seem to predict a wide array of health outcomes. You have parsimonious, parsimonious modeling with greater statistical power, given that the composite score is one independent predictor rather than multiple collinear variables. And there's general ease of interpretation for laypersons and policymakers. Now, of course, traditional composite scores also have their disadvantages. Um, for example, there's an underlying assumption of unidimensionality when uh, in fact, we might be dealing with multidimensional constructs. There's unit weighting. So all stressors are assumed to contribute equally to the aggregation or accumulation of stress. Um, there's measurement error, right? And that measurement error is compounded when we're summing together multiple independent uh, measures. And then, of course, the correlated structure of all of these independent stressors is lost when you calculate a simple unit weighted composite score. So these were some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages that my colleagues and I uh, expounded uh, in our, our paper here titled Cumulative Stress, a General S Factor and the Structure of Stress. Um, and in this paper, uh, in addition to bringing light, uh, the highlighting the, the advantages and disadvantages, strengths and weaknesses of the traditional sort of com composite score approach to operationalize cumulative stress, um, we did at least two other, I think, noteworthy things in this paper. And one is that we actually formally tested a sum score model. So although some might not be aware, there is a formal psychometric model that corresponds to a sum score. Uh, that model is a unidimensional confirmatory factor analysis model in which you have unit weighting across all of the indicators and you have your measurement error constrained to zero. Okay, so this measurement model is statistically equivalent or rather will, uh, if you estimate factor scores for this measurement model, you'll, uh, end up with scores that are uh, perfectly correlated with some score. And it fits the data really poorly, right? So when we actually formally test this model from a sort of traditional psychometric standpoint, the fit statistics are absolute garbage, right? We wanna say CFI typically above 0.9, 
if you rely on the sort of Hugh and Bettler thresholds from the I believe mid nineties. RMS yay, we like to see below 0 0.05, all right? So with the CFI at zero and RMS EA at 0 0.306, uh, this is uh, evincing egregious fit to the data, okay? So from a measurement standpoint, the sum score model, uh, it, it, it holds no weight, right? It's, it's, it's collapsing. So in addition to demonstrating that from a psychometric standpoint, the sum score model is poorly fitting to the data, we went ahead and developed this model at the cross section. So what we have here uh, is we have 19 different individual measures, psychosocial stress, we have lifetime discrimination, daily discrimination, lack of coworker support, lack of supervisor support, high job demands, risk of injury at work, work and family spillover, family and work spillover, inequality at work, inequality with family, inequality at home, or neighborhood quality, family strain, spousal strain, marital risk, friendship strain, not having enough money to meet your needs, having difficulty paying your bills, and a subjective uh, rating of your current financial situation. And we can see that all of these indicators uh, are of, of individual stressors are allowed to load onto one or more subordinate dimension of stress, which we titled discrimination stress factor, a home and work stress factor, perceived inequality, relationship stress and financial stress, which all in turn load onto a general higher order factor, which we coined the S factor, um, paying homage to uh, the G factor in intelligence research or the P factor in psychopathology research. Um, so not unlike other human individual differences, psychosocial stressors can be understood and modeled using this sort of hierarchical approach, right? So we know that Personality has a sort of hierarchical structure, though not a single common factor at the top, uh, rather two, two latent factors. Um, and then, of course, we have G for intelligence, a similar factor structure, and we're, we're seeing a, a similar pattern of results here. So one thing that we went ahead and did was we tested the longitudinal measurement and variance of this higher order factor model, cumulative stress, right? And keeping in mind that this S factor, right, it's capturing the general tendency for these subordinate factors of stress to correlate or co-occur. So individuals with high S factor scores are generally gonna have high discrimination, home and work, perceived inequality, relationship and financial stress in their lives. So these are the parameter estimates uh, from a actual a longitudinal model uh, that um, assumed strict measurement variance. So we have the variances of latent factors, we have higher order factor loadings, lower order factor loadings, and residual variances that are all constrained to equality across measurement location. So only a single time point is represented here, but these parameter estimates actually can be held forward, not only here in the first wave of data collection, but also approximately 10 years later at a second wave, and then again, 10 years later at a third wave. Um, so these are the estimates that we have from our strict longitudinal uh, measurement and variance model. So compared to using our traditional composite scores as opposed to this hierarchical model, right? We're formally accounting for and representing the multidimensional nature of cumulative stress as opposed to the traditional composite score, which assumes it's unidimensional. We have unit weighting here, where we have individual weights, right, from the hierarchical model. Some scores, your measurement error is ignored. The hierarchical model, it's formally estimated. And then finally, the correlated structure of our stressors is not ignored or lost, right, but it's actually formally modeled. So as I see it, these are some of the primary advantage of uh, adopting a hierarchical modeling approach to operationalizing cumulative stress in contrast to the calculation of traditional composite scores. But of course, this only helps us capture one of what I think are two crucial elements of cumulative stress. One being simultaneous exposure to multiple stressors. So this is captured by the S factor, right? Which is going to capture the general tendency for subordinate factors of stress to correlate or co-occur. Well, what about repeated exposures over time, right? Cumulative stress isn't just about 
being simultaneously exposed or, or having to experience multiple stressors at the same time in your life. But there are also certain stressors that are chronic and that reoccur over and over again um, over time. So if we're gonna use the S factor to capture simultaneous exposure, how do we also capture repeated exposures to stressors and hence measure the second crucial element of cumulative stress? Well, let's think about a hypothetical individual, say at time one here on the x-axis, and we have on the y-axis, there's a hypothetical stress scale, right? Where we're going from low stress at the bottom here to high stress at the top. And say this particular individual starts out relatively low, their first measurement, and then at the second measurement occasion, they've gone a little bit higher here on our scale of stress, experienced a couple more stressors. And then finally, at the third measurement occasion, they've now spiked quite high and have uh, reported experiencing a high number of stressors. Now, the traditional composite score approach, right, you would take the number of stressors at time one, the number at time two, the number at time three, and then just calculate a sum score, right, plain and simple. But... Another alternative might be to calculate the distance of the um, in, uh, both the initial and last score from ground or from zero point on your stress scale, and then calculate area under the curve of the individual stress trajectory. Okay, so some folks um, who are listening uh, might have a bell ring where they say, I've seen this before, right? Sure, well, this is a method that's commonly used in neuroendocrinology to measure uh, stress hormones beneath the skin, right? Either diurnal patterns of cortisol over, over a day um, or measuring uh, sort of cortisol or uh, alpha amylase reactivity to acute laboratory stressors. Right, area under the curve with respect to ground is a, a pretty common and widely used method in neuroendocrinology to capture the cumulative exposure to stress hormones. So the simple thought that I had and was interested in testing is, well, if area under the curve with respect to ground is a, a decent means of operationalizing stress beneath the skin, perhaps it will be a good way of operationalizing stressors outside the skin as well. So now let's just think of another hypothetical here who starts at time one, they're a bit higher than the last folk, move over here to time two and then at time three. Now, another alternative from a, a sort of longitudinal modeling perspective is right, is like, we might wanna just estimate a mixed effects model, get a random slope. Sure, we can do that, it's no problem. We could also have a random intercept can estimate that, but that really doesn't get us at repeated exposures, right? We're kind of back at the cross section if we're focusing on an intercept, but it's that slope we might be interested in, right? Or the, the, the rate of change for the individual. So we can take a random slope and we can save that as our longitudinal index of cumulative stress. It's a viable option. Or again, you could calculate area under the curve with respect to ground. Or if you think that it's not really the absolute or initial level of stress that's really important for a health outcome, uh, because people habituate or become inured to the sort of average or typical level of stress in their lives, um, it's really the changes in stress that are more important. Well, what you could do is calculate area on the curve with respect to ground and then subtract out the base, and now you have the area on the curve with respect to increase. Okay, so another, another potential candidate here for operationalizing repeated exposures to stress over time. So these are the sort of four garden variety options that I have in mind here, right? We have area under the curve with respect to ground, area under the curve with respect to increase. We have a traditional composite sub score. We also can take a random linear slope from a mixed effects model. Now I did highlight these trajectories. I intentionally made them different um, just to emphasize that although uh, the latter is derived from the former, um, you might expect differential prediction of health outcomes um, because their rank order can change depending on which is calculated, right? So if you calculate area under the curve uh, with respect uh, to ground, it's going to be greater for this trajectory than that. 
Um, and then it flips for area under the curve with respect to increase, right? So you can get different rank orderings of participants in your sample, depending on which of the two are calculated. But just from an intuitive standpoint, right? AUC is reducing information from repeated measures into a single score, just like a sum score and a random slope, but it's aggregating information about both the initial level and the rate and direction of change for each person. And unlike a traditional linear mixed effects model, it can accommodate nonlinear change and even non-monotonic change with no problem. Um, and again, it can be used to test different theories, right? If you have a particular theory that emphasizes the absolute um, or initial level of stress, then one might expect AUC with respect to ground to outperform these other metrics and prediction of a health outcome. On the other hand, if again, if, if one has become habituated or uh, a nerd to their stressors and have adapted, and we really think it's the volatility or changes in stressors that are, are, are driving the pathogenesis of this health outcome, well then, right, we might expect uh, either the random linear slope or AUC with respect to, to increase uh, to be the best focal predictor of that particular outcome, right? So we can use these different ways of operationalizing cumulative stress over time to potentially uh, test or tease apart different theories. And really what I decided to do here uh, was to conduct a battle of the predictors, right? So I, I'm not theoretically wed to any of these approaches. Um, I'm just purely interested in, you know, identifying the optimal means of operationalizing cumulative stress to maximize criterion-oriented validity, right? I want to I want to increase predictive validity of health outcomes based on my aggregate measure of cumulative stress. So how do we do that? Well, that's just have all the predictors battle each other and see which is the strongest predictor of various health outcomes. So is AUC for trajectories of stress more strongly related to health outcomes than traditional sum scores and random slopes? So the analytic procedures that I followed to uh, conduct this battle of the predictors, again, I already mentioned first, of course, we started with testing the longitudinal measurement invariance of that hierarchical model of cumulative stress, uh, going to ensure compar comparability uh, of those scores over time. And then we, we, we save the estimated factor scores. And then we go ahead and plot individual trajectories of uh, the various dimensions of stress um, from that hierarchical model, as well as health outcomes. And then of course we calculate the different composites for our trajectories of stress, AUC with respect to ground increase, our continuous sum score, our cumulative exposure index and random slopes. And then finally, we're going to estimate a series of successive multiple regressions where we're comparing AUCG and AUCUI to these other uh, various um, composite scores and random slopes as predictors of, of physical and cognitive health outcomes. And then finally, to get a better grip on the magnitude of effect sizes, I used a stratified relative weights analysis to estimate the contributions of both demographic factors and these dimensions of cumulative stress to the prediction of health outcomes at different ages in adulthood. In terms of uh, the sample and the measures, uh, we're using data from the study of midlife development in the United States. Uh, we have three waves of data collection uh, that are each spaced approximately a decade apart. Um, and then of course we have a myriad psychosocial stressors here uh, that I had reviewed before. Um, and we saw there as indicators of uh, the hierarchical model. And then we have various physical health outcomes and cognitive health outcomes. So I decided to focus on body mass index, number of chronic conditions, basic and intermediate activities of daily living, and then a composite index of executive function and memory from the BTAC. So here's what the individual trajectory plots of the various dimensions of cumulative stress look like. Um, so here we have the cumulative S factor, right? This is that higher order little S factor. And these each individual black line represents an S factor trajectory for a given subject. Um, so at least, all right, and these dashed lines here that are kind of hard to see, uh, this is the average losis trends, so even some locally estimated scatter plot smoothing to see if there's any nonlinearity here. Uh, we can see those, those dashed trends through the line, uh, through, through the cloud of individual trajectories. 
Um, and at least a couple of things I think are noteworthy here. One, how incredibly stable this higher order S factor is, right? I mean, most of the trajectories that we see appear to be relatively flat. And this finding is echoed just by the test retest correlations among the S factor over these decades. It's correlated at 0.9 in that longitudinal measurement and variance models. We have very high temporal stability of that general S factor of cumulative stress over time. But despite that really high temporal stability, we do still see some, of course, some variation in the individual trajectories. The perceived inequality factor looks quite similar. Um, we get a little bit more individual differences in uh, rates and directions change for the other four subordinate factors of stress, home and work-related stress here, discrimination exposure, relationship stress, and financial stress. But these are the individual trajectories that you see here, 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 and here. These are the trajectories under which I am going to go ahead and calculate the areas under the curve. Now, in terms of our uh, health, let's see if I can get this. Lost here. Yeah, I lost my clicker. I don't know why. Okay, I'll just click from here. Oh, doesn't want. Doesn't want me to click from there either. Oh, there we go. Okay. Now moving on to the individual trajectory plots of our various health outcomes. Right, we see here body mass index, difficulty with intermediate activities of daily living. Here are the memory scores. Right, we're seeing expected sort of age-related decline. Um, number of chronic conditions, kind of expected age-related increases. And then these are difficulty with basics activities. And here's finally the individual trajectory plots of the executive functioning scores, again, showing expected age-related decreases over time. So these are gonna be the health outcomes that we're predicting from our various uh, composites of cumulative stress. So right, the next step, of course, is to calculate AUCG and AUCI. It looks like the Cambridge math formulas have gotten completely debacled here. Um, so of course, that, those aren't the formulas. <laughs> uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, when you calculate area under the curve with respect to ground and increase, you do get roughly normal distributions, uh, which of course is, is handy if you are thinking about cumulative stress as being a particular outcome, right? Uh, the, the normal distribution is going to allow us to, oh, rely on standard parametric statistics, right? So simple, straightforward sort of linear regressions. We don't have to worry about robust estimators. Uh, so it's clean in, in this sense. So then finally, multiple regressions, right? To conduct the battle of the predictors. So we have five focal predictors, continuous composite index and the cumulative risk exposure index, which of course are ultimately unweighted sum scores. We have our random linear slope, AUCG and AUCI. Then we have covariates, age, uh, sex, self-reported race and level of education. And then the outcomes, uh, there are actually 12 in total. So we have uh, BMI at the last wave of data collection. Then we also have changes in BMI from the first to the last wave of data collection and so on and so forth for each of these outcomes, right? So we have six outcomes and then we both have their level at, at wave three, the last wave of data collection, and then also changes um, in those outcomes. So, we're not going to be relying heavily on null hypothesis significance testing, right, of course, because of the multiplicity of our tests, uh, but instead are going to fed, focus on the size and, and precision of uh, effect sizes. So here's the results of the battle of the predictors. So to help guide you through what you're looking at here, on the y-axis here, we have a standardized regression coefficient from the multiple regressions that I just mentioned. Now, of course, each of the composite predictors, AUCG, standardized sum score, sum of dichotomized stressors, that's the relative uh, cumulative risk index, AUCI and slope, uh, they weren't entered simultaneously, of course, into the regressions because they're based on the same information. They'd be too highly collinear. Um, but instead, you know, you have a multiple regression with all of the demographic covariates, and you plug in one of the cumulative stress predictors, then flip-flop it, right? Swap it out with a different predictor in each of the successive models. And then you could just plot the standardized regression coefficients and their 95% confidence intervals, 
right? So again, y-axis is the standardized regression coefficient. The x-axis here are actually the different dimensions of stress, right? So we have the s-factor, disk is for the discrimination exposure, home and work, perceived inequality, relationship stress, and financial stress. And then each of the colored and uh, shaped points here are representing one of the different predictors. So the black squares are area under the curve with respect to ground. We have the standardized sum scores, the purple circle, and so on. So there's a clear winner in this battle of predictors. Like it's not really even close for maybe a little bit closer for the cognitive health outcomes here. And it really pulls away the physical health outcomes, right? Number of chronic conditions, we see regardless of the dimension of cumulative stress, AUC with respect to ground is out, always out predicting, out performing the other composites. Um, same for body mass index, though not quite as pronounced, uh, just as pronounced for intermediate and basic activities of daily living. And then we see this same pattern of results for executive function and working memory. Although, of course, we don't, we see that the various composite scores aren't quite as spread out, right, in terms of, of the differential predictive power that we're getting from them. But nevertheless, a unambiguous, clear winner in the battle of the predictors. It's area under the curve with respect to ground. So just to sort of conduct a sort of a validity check here, I also wanted to look at the impact of various demographic factors on area under the S factor curve, since it was the winner of the battle of the predictors. And again, here we have standardized regression coefficients of age, sex, black race, other race, and level of education predicting the area under the S factor curve. And I think these uh, results just kind of, they pass the smell test, right? So if we look at, for example, the effect of uh, black race as opposed to white on the cumulative uh, S-factor scores and also the subordinate dimensions, right? We see that levels of stress are higher for black versus white and particularly pronounced for what's this year? That's area under the curve for the discrimination exposure factor, right? So this, this is encouraging, right? That the results are just sort of passing a common sense or common sense intuition or smell test. Again, you know, similar pattern of results for other race, ethnicity, level of education, higher education, lower stress, protective as we would expect. Not big sex differences, but uh, if anything, slightly lower levels for males as opposed to females. And then stress is decreasing with age, right? Older age, lower levels of stress. But at least we have some uh, sort of encouraging uh, convergent validity here, we can say. So then finally, moving on now to the relative weights analysis, because we might now, sure, look back at these standardized regression coefficients and say, okay, well, 0.4, that's a decent sized standardized regression coefficient, but that's got a better grip on the actual effect size. And doing so while well, we account for this, right? There's collinearity among the demographic uh, factors or covariates uh, with stress. So what we do is we conduct a relative weights analysis uh, whereby you uh, transform uh, the original variables uh, that are predictors in your regression to be perfectly orthogonal while maintaining uh, maximal relatedness to the original untransformed scores. Um, and then this allows you to calculate uh, unique contributions of each of your predictors to a particular health outcome. So if we look at chronic conditions here, the y-axis would be the contribution to the explained variance. And then we have color code coordinated here in each of these uh, stacked bars, uh, the contribution to the explained variance by area under the curve with respect to the S factor, and then those demographics. Um, and I guess the, the take home message here is that at least with respect to chronic conditions, you got a really big cumulative exposure, cumulative stress impact. How big? Well, considerably larger than any of these demographic factors. So if you think that age and sex and race and education are important for understanding chronic conditions, then you must concede that so is cumulative stress, right? Because we're talking about roughly 10 to 13% of the variation in number of chronic conditions. It's explained by area under the S factor curve. 
less impressive results for BMI, uh, but less impressive across the board, right? Like in terms of the total explained variance, the R squared was smaller for BMI, but still we're getting appreciable contributions of the Q area under the S factor curve and at different ages, right? So the stratified part of the relative rates analysis is that it's done um, across different age groups, right? So you get the unique contributions for folks in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. So again, we're seeing non-negligible uh, contributions to the explained variance and our health outcome, in this case, BMI by S factor. Huge effects for intermediate activities of daily living, right? Um, for folks in their in their 40s, we're talking about almost 18% of the variance. And then that declines as folks age, but we're still talking about over 6% of the variation, even for folks in, in their 80s. So big, big effects here. Similar story for basic activities of daily living. Uh, just across the board, the most pronounced uh, predictor is our, our winner of the battle of the predictors for our uh, measure or means of operationalizing cumulative stress. Not quite as impressive as we saw from the multiple regression, uh, multiple regression plots uh, for executive function. So this is the, the one instance, or at least the mental health outcomes as you'll see are the instance in which we actually get a demographic factor that is making a larger contribution to the explained variance than our composite index of cumulative stress. In this case, the highest level of education completed by participants was explaining the most variation in cumulative stress, but second place followed by uh, our, our measure of uh, area under the S factor curve. And then a similar story for working memory, right? In this case, it's uh, primarily sex differences we're seeing are accounting for differences in working memory. Uh, it's also a, a, a non-negligible effect of education. And then we're seeing kind of tied in second place uh, or maybe hopping between second and third place, uh, the cumulative stress measure um, as a potent predictor of, of working memory. So as the summary of all of our six health outcomes, um, just for the sake of brevity, I'm, I'm not presenting results here for the contributions to changes in R squared. That's also because there's little rhetorical value gained because the results look so similar. You know, very similar pattern of results. You tend to see maybe a eh, 10 to 20% decrease in the total amount of variance explained, but in terms of the contributions of the demographic factors in our measure of cumulative stress, the, the, the pattern of results looks uh, strikingly similar. So to summarize findings, we have measurement and variance of our hierarchical structure of cumulative stress. So that's good, right? We have, uh, make valid inferences about changes in our, our construct of interest over time. An area on the curve with respect to ground is outperforming our traditional unit weighted sum scores and random linear slopes in the prediction of our physical and cognitive health outcomes, at least the six that I examined in this analysis. And then finally, the contributions of cumulative stress to the explained variance in our health outcomes is typically greater than or equal to demographic factors. Um, with the caveat that dimensions of stress are explaining more variance in the physical health outcomes than in the cognitive health outcomes. But right, appreciable effect sizes. If we think that age and sex and race matter for these health outcomes, then we must concede that cumulative stress matters just as much or more. So in terms of the general conclusions, you know, I think the measurement of cumulative stress really stands to benefit from increased construct validation efforts which I tried to do here, right? And I just think it's important that we not forget lessons from individual differences um, in psychometrics, right? Because as I mentioned before, not unlike many other human individual differences like personality and intelligence, psychopathology, exposure to stressors uh, can be understood in a, a sort of hierarchical fashion. And then finally, right, the data reduction techniques that are commonly used in neuroendocrinology to measure stress hormones underneath the skin can also be used to measure the accumulation of stressors outside the skin. Um, but further construct validation efforts are needed. Now, of course, there's a number of limitations, as always, to any approach, 
First, in order to calculate area under the curve with respect to grounded increase, we need to estimate our factor scores. And this is reintroducing measurement error, right, into our S factor, which isn't the case when we're still in latent space, uh, but is necessary if we're going to go ahead and use those trapezoidal formulas to get area under the curve. There's, of course, the risk of contributions of shared method variance, right? Like these indicators, although not the outcomes, but the indicators are all based on self-reports. So, of course, uh, the, this sort of methodological variance can artifactually contribute uh, to a general S factor, as we saw. Um, I mean, this, this is a story that personality psychologists know quite well. Um, for quite some time, it was thought that there was a general factor of personality. Uh, it turns out that if you factor analyze um, data that is both from self and informant reports, then that general factor goes away and you end up with two higher order factors, um, which the, the big five domains load onto. Um, but it wasn't discovered that that general factor of personality was actually artifactual until people started doing the multi-trait, multi-method sort of factor analyses where they can begin to tease apart the shared method variance. Now, it's something that I'm not able to do with the data from the MIDAS study, um, so uh, still remains an outstanding uh, limitation, and it remains unclear whether the S factor will persist um, if we have uh, multi-informant data. And then finally... Another limitation that I've been thinking about and I'm still kind of struggling with is, you know, what's zero stress? Because one thing I didn't mention is that in order to ensure true areas for area under the curve with respect to ground, you have to center all the estimated factor scores at the lowest observed score, okay? If you don't center at the baseline of the score, then the trapezoidal formula can end up generating negative areas, which, should make your head hurt, right? It's oxymoronic. Like, there's no such thing as a negative area. That, that makes no sense, right? So typically, we use area under the curve with respect to ground and neuroendocrinology to capture accumulation of variables that are measured on ratio scales, right? That have true zero points. I don't know if there is a true zero point for cumulative stress, and I'm not sure whether that matters, but it might. Right. I, I mean, I have to artifactually create a zero point to ensure the calculation of true areas. Right. So you got to do the centering. Um, but I do wonder, right, that like, what does that zero really represent? Well, it means that you have none of the measured stressors in that particular study, in that sample. But it just seems implausible. There's something nagging me about this, that it's like, well, it's not really zero stress, right? Because there's all these other stressors that inevitably aren't going to be measured. And I'm still struggling to think about how this might impact the internal validity of, of that composite measure. Um, and then finally, there's the replicability of the factor loadings and weights from the hierarchical model, which in turn are used to estimate your factor scores. Now, at least in MIDAS, we do know that across waves of data collection, the factor loadings replicate. You can also uh, randomly uh, divide, say, uh, the first wave of data into a, a training and replication samples. You get excellent replication of the factor loadings that way. We also pulled in data from the MIDAS refresher cohort, which is a totally different group of, of individuals and who, um, uh, they collected data uh, immediately following the 2008 recession. So these folks uh, were also under more financial duress um, than the other folks in the sample. And the factor loadings replicated quite well. So at least within MIDAS, we're getting really good replicability of factor loadings. Is this going to hold an HRS, right, where there are many overlapping measures of psychosocial stressors as in MIDAS? I don't know. This is an open-ended question, and this is something that I'm currently exploring. Um, in HRS data. Um, hopefully, I'm hoping that stress researchers get to a point where we have so many different factor analyses of myriad psychosocial stressors that we can begin to meta-analyze uh, factor loadings and then we can get actual meta-analytic estimates for what factor loadings should be um, and hence can be used in our uh, scale constructions across studies. In terms of future directions, right? Of course, measuring the exposome, right? The totality of pathogenic exposures of the life course. This is 
remains an outstanding challenge of epidemiology and something that I'm, I'm focused on. Uh, much of my training uh, began with uh, quantitative genetics, uh, twin, twin and family modeling, polygenic risk score analyses, things like that. Um, but I think uh, quantitative geneticists have uh, relative inattention uh, to having formal models of the environment. We have great models um, and very complex methods, you know, like genome-wide complex trait analysis, genomic structural equation model, LD score regression. We have all of these theoretically robust and sophisticated methods in genetics, but we tend to have fairly crude operationalizations of the environment. And that's something that I'd really like to work on as I continue, uh, continue this work. So I also want to expand the hierarchical model to include indicators of cumulative advantage. Right? So the model so far is really only capturing the bad side of things, but there are lots of supportive and protective factors of the environment that if ultimately we want to capture the exposome are going to need to be incorporated into the model. There's also a subsample of identical twins in the MIDAS data. So I'm pleading this to conduct a co-twin co control analysis to try to strengthen causal inference. Right, The idea here is if you have identical twins, who are raised in the same home, but they differ on their levels of cumulative stress. Um, does the identical twin who have higher levels of cumulative stress also have the more deleterious outcome? If this is true on average, um, then that sort of effect can't be confounded by genetics or by any shared familial factors, right? So it's a really strong sort of quasi experimental approach to strengthening uh, our inferences. And that's something I'm currently working on. And then I'm finally um, also thinking about expanding our physical health outcomes to include more biomarkers, IL-6 and some others. Now, finally, I'd like to end uh, with one remaining question. So having seen this hierarchical model, one might rightfully ask, are stressors really reflective indicators? Right? So factor analysis models are effect indicators or re reflective indicator models. Okay, And someone might object and say, well, this doesn't coincide with a common sense or intuitive understanding of cumulative stress. Right? It's like, in other words, cumulative stress is the result of experiencing multiple psychosocial and environmental stressors and not vice versa. Right? It's not that the, the, the S factor doesn't cause individual stressors to emerge. It's the other way around. Right? A fair objection. Right? I, I hear it. Another way of phrasing this is someone might object, hey, listen, man, there's no unobserved factor of cumulative stress that acts as like an evil eye causing individuals to experience variant stressors. So someone may object that your hierarchical measurement model just does not, it doesn't coincide with common sense intuition about how we think about reflective indicator models, right? Cumulative stress is an emerging construct. It's not a reflective construct, right? So reflective indicators I hypothesized to be caused by the latent factor or underlying construct, for example, depression or intelligence, while formative indicators are the cause of the latent factor or emerging construct. So someone might say, listen, you really ought to have a formative indicator model here, right? Not a reflective indicator model. Another way of saying this again, for a third time is, the direction of your arrows are wrong. They need to be flipped, okay? So cumulative stress should be measured using formative indicators. You flip your arrows. Okay, so we can think about this, right? This is a, all right, a crude simplification of the model that I presented. And someone might object that this should really be my model. There should be a formative indicator that maps more closely onto this idea of an emergent construct. Okay, well, this model is locally identified. Right? It can be estimated. This cannot. Okay? Doesn't matter what you throw at it. Doesn't matter. You can do MCMC, maximum likelihood. It doesn't matter. There's no, there's no estimator that can get you uh, results for this model. It's just not locally identified. Right? It can only be identified and estimated when you include greater than one dependent variable. Okay. So you would need to add in at least two DVs here in order to even estimate this formative indicator model. Okay, well, not too keen on that, right? Um, because we'd end up getting a poor or kind of strange measurement model, depending on what the DVs are, right? Like if these DVs here 
um, I don't know, or like strive, uh, anxiety and depression. Well, fine. And this is like an internalizing factor that you're predicting, right? But if these outcomes are like BMI and chronic conditions, it's not clear, right? You end up with a very strange measurement model, right? And the other thing that's important to remember here is that with path diagrams, the direction or, or location of your indicators is meaningless, right? We have conventions that we follow. We like to go directionally from left to right. High order factors go high, indicators are low, but this is just, conven con uh, this is just convention, right? Ultimately, the path diagrams are a visual representation of a mathematical model. You can use path tracing rules to regenerate the model implied variances and covariances of that particular model. And so you can flip around, if you know path tracing rules, you can flip around from here to there, right? So I can put these stressors down here and the DVs over here. I can flip them, put the stressors over here, DVs, same mathematical model. Right, you're gonna get the same exact variance and covariance model implied uh, estimates using our path tracing rules. Um, and when it's restructured this way, I think it becomes more clear what you've actually done. You don't have a model. There's no mo measurement model of, of the stressors at all, right? Like what you have here is you have a latent dependent variable that's defined by these two or three or four indicators. And then you just have a bunch of independent predictors like you'd have in a multiple regression that are predicting the outcome. So the problem with someone suggesting that I ought to have a formative indicator model is that the model's not locally identified and it's really not much of a measurement model at all. You're conceding that you're really not modeling. There's no measurement going on at all. You're, you're just estimating the individual or unique predictions of your various stressors on the dependent variable, which you've actually formally modeled. So, yes, there's no evil eye, but that's okay. And the, the reflective indicator model is still preferable. Just drop the effects indicator language. Okay? Like, after all, cause and effect relations can't be inferred from either model anyways. They're just regression pathways. And once you call them that, then the concern about it being a reflective or formative indicator model hopefully should just dissolve in your head when you remember, oh, yeah, these have nothing to do with cause and effect. They're just regression pathways. 